Hi everyone, I'm Phoebe Liu and I'm a reporter here at Forbes. Recently I teamed up with my colleague staff writer Zach Everson to write an article about Timothy Mellon, a top donor during this election cycle. Zach, it's great to have you here. So yeah, to get things started, can you say a little bit more about who Tim Mellon is and why he's so important during this current election cycle? Yeah, gladly. So. You know, most of the people who are big political donors are names people have heard of. They've they've made their name in industry. On the Democratic side, you have like Reid Hoffman, on um, Michael Bloomberg these days. On the Republican side, you've got um, Linda McMahon, uh, you've got Sheldon Adelson. But all of a sudden, in the last campaign, this guy Timothy Mellon popped up, and it was like, who the heck is he? Uh, when he made a massive donation to a pro-Trump super PAC, and that's one of the things we should say up front, like. When we talk about them backing candidates, it's going to super PACs, which can allow, accept an unlimited amount of funds versus the campaign, which is capped at just a few thousand. So uh, Mellon really came to people's attention during the last campaign when he when he made a sizable contribution to the pro-Trump PAC. And then he uh, he did it again this campaign, where so far he has dropped, I think it's $75 million plus to a pro-Trump super PAC, 50 million of which came the day after Trump was convicted on those 34 felony charges. <laughs> But wait, there's more. He also donated $25 million to Robert F. Kennedy Jr., which is largely unheard of for anybody to don make massive donations like this. You hear about it a little bit where, um, you know, when one of Clarence Thomas's friends made a little bit of a donation to Cornell West, and it's like, oh, is he trying to boost his candidacy to help the Republicans? But to come in this heavy uh, for two candidates is, is unheard of. Yeah, that's really amazing. And I think what's even crazier about this is that he insisted to me multiple times over email that he's not a billionaire, despite donating some $300 million to federal political committees, state candidates, and another, I think, $53 million to fund the Texas border wall, um, which is just a massive amount of money um, compared to, I guess, what he claims to have. And I guess to say a little bit more about where he's getting all of this money, obviously his last name is Mellon, so he is a fourth, I believe, generation descendant of the Mellon Bank people. So his grandfather was Andrew Mellon, who served as Treasury Secretary under three Republican presidents and um, was a major steward to really grow the Mellon banking fortune in Pittsburgh into one of the largest institutions in the country. Um, he notably invested in Gulf Oil, which is the predecessor to Chevron now, um, and left, I think, $23 million in private company stock, basically at book value, so probably worth a lot more than that. Adjusted by inflation alone, that amount is worth about $500 million today. Um, he left that to his three grandchildren, of which Timothy Mellon was one. So he was always like very comfortable financially, but also decided to make a lot of money, or decided, like worked really hard, probably took advantage of a lot of um, rank-and-file workers to build a railroad empire that he sold two years ago for $600 million to a public railroad company. and. I assume that a lot of the proceeds from that went into his political giving as well. Yeah, that would make sense because we saw yeah. that spike in political giving start around that time. He had been giving for a long time. I think his first political contribution that we can track back in the FEC was to uh, Senator Ted Kennedy of Massachusetts. So not exactly uh, somebody you'd expect a major Trump donor to uh, to be funding, but. Uh, we definitely did see that that spike around then and you know before he went into trump he started donating 10 million dollars five million dollars here and there to groups that were trying to help uh republicans take control of both chambers of the house but you know one of the things working on this with you that i found very interesting was just the valuation you know i i do money in politics i've done a couple valuations for uh you know joe biden marion williamson cornell west um and it's it's never anybody who's worth this much money though and so the whole process was fascinating to me because I'm coming at it from a money and politics angle where right. my thought is, of course, this guy's worth a billion dollars. He's donated 300 million to <laughs> political campaigns. But can you talk if, like a little bit more about the process, how you guys went through this trying to come up with a valuation and what his response to that, like what that had you rethinking? Yeah, for sure. So 
I don't know. I do a lot of valuations of billionaires, the richest people in the world, like the Zuckerbergs and Ellisons and Bezoses. Um, and still, even considering that, I looked at how much money he's given to political causes and was like, there's no way he's not a billionaire. Um, but what's really interesting is that the Mellon family has kept their fortune so private for so many, I guess, for two or three centuries and have never really put any of that money into public companies or anything that has to be disclosed in a way that us nosy journalists who want to know what they're worth um, can actually find out. And over the years, various Forbes reporters trying to estimate the value of the Mellon family fortune have called Mellon family members, and none of them seem to know what their family is worth either. So it's very difficult to actually figure out. Um, I drew from this fantastic book by David Canadine about Andrew Mellon, which was produced in cooperation with the Mellon family. They gave him full access to all of his tax, tax documents, estate papers, um, all of that. And from that book, I learned that he had put the $23 million gift into a bunch of trusts for his grandchildren. Um, and basically from that initial inheritance, so they... I guess to give a little bit of context, um, the Mellon family was known to pass down money in like generation skipping trusts um, for tax reasons. So we were guessing that most of Timothy Mellon's money came from his grandfather, Andrew, because um, his father, Paul, was mostly racing horses. He won the Kentucky Derby, um, donated hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to like art museums and various other philanthropic causes. Um, so he wasn't really making a lot of money for himself. So Timothy Mellon's money came from Andrew, and this was $23 million in like mid-1930s US dollars. And if we kind of think about how that could have been invested over the years within these trusts, um, a benchmark that we like to use is the S&P 500. Um, if you assume that this investment performed to 75% of the S&P 500, so not as good as the stock market, but kind of close, um, it would be worth $3.6 billion today. And if you assume that that was divided evenly between his three grandchildren, of which Timothy was one, um, they would each have around $1.2 billion. But when I ran this by Tim Mellon, he responded back, basically billionaire not, never have been, never will be, and didn't answer any of my other questions about like how he stewarded his railroad and grew his fortune further from that um, with the 600 million sale, where we also assume that he was a majority owner in the railroad because he co-founded it. And there were documents we found from, I don't know, the 1980s that showed that he and his co-founder were the only shareholders in the company and they never took outside investment. Um, it was financed in part by a loan from his family's bank, and we assume in part by his inheritance. So based on all of those things, and then subtracting out the, I think, 296 million in total, phil uh, sorry, not philanthropic, like political donations, um, we're estimating that even though he insists he's not a billionaire, um, there's kind of no way he isn't close unless his investment from his inheritance performed super poorly, which is also possible. Yeah, that is that is just fascinating. I mean, looking at the swings when you guys were looking at that valuation, yeah. is it common for a billionaire to push back? You know, when we think somebody's a billionaire, for mm -hmm. them to push back on that, and if so, are they usually as succinct as Timothy Mellon was in pushing <laughs> back on that? Yeah, I think it depends on the billionaire. Um, I work with a lot of tech people. They usually just like to say nothing at all, um, and let us come to our own conclusions and our own estimates. I. Timothy Mellon is kind of known to be kind of a private. People have called him reclusive for decades, but he hates it when people call him that. But he did move to the middle of nowhere, bought 6,700 acres of land in Wyoming to get away from like noisy Connecticut, um, I guess, or the Northeast where he was, his railroads were based. Um, all the way back in 2005, because he just didn't want to be around people anymore. So he just doesn't He's a man of few words from everything that I can tell. Um, so I wasn't expecting him to respond to me when I reached out, um, running all of these things by him, asking him if he wanted to tell me more about his railroad company and how he 
forged a career in an industry that was really not doing well at the time he decided to enter into it. Um, so the first email, he was just basically saying he's not a billionaire, um, one sentence, warmly to him. Um, and then I followed up asking him if he'd be willing to talk to me again. And he sent back a New York Post article. This was the weekend after Biden didn't do so well in the debate. Um, so it was an article of basically a plane flying over Biden's post-debate fundraiser saying, by done. Um, and in the article, it said it was funded by like an anonymous Republican mega donor. We don't know if that's him or not. Um, and then I followed up a third time asking again about the net worth, saying like, here's what we're going to print and the reasoning why we're going to include the fact that you said that you're not a billionaire. Um, what do you think? And he sent back, I think two minutes later from his BlackBerry 10, just no period, no period. And that was the last thing I heard from him. Would have loved to hear more about his story because it seems like he has such a fascinating narrative, like licensed pilot, thousands of acres of land in Wyoming, built a 4,000 mile railroad empire um, over four decades, like from a really famous uh, banking family, I guess. And I don't know, would have loved to hear more from him, but that was all we got, unfortunately. Yeah, we had, we had to settle for the memoir, um, which he yes. published in 2015. Say more about that, yeah. You, yeah, you, you did a phenomenal job tracking it down. It's been out of print. Um, shortly after one of his donations was public in the last campaign, uh, it was reported, I think, by the Washington Post that he had a chapter in there called Slavery Rideau, which he produced, which he basically compared a lot of social programs to slavery and the book was pulled from the market shortly thereafter. And uh, you did a great job of tracking that down. That certainly had some insights, um, especially about his shifting politics. So he mentioned that early on, he, uh, in the, I guess it was 60s or 70s, started a foundation called the Sachin Fund. And it backed groups that were supported by people like Ralph Nader and Gloria Steinem, uh, not exactly uh, MAGA type people. Um, but it sounded like by the end of that, he was a little bit disheartened with the results. Uh, blamed it on not having, maybe misunder, maybe underestimating uh, human nature in that regard. So that was some pretty interesting stuff. The book itself had, uh, I mean, there was an appendix there on some of his favorite meals. Uh, there was one on his illnesses. Um, it was, it was, it was interesting. Um, I thought there was a lot of it that was spent on. I would have liked to have heard, learned a lot more about that foundation versus the new home he was building. But you know, hey, he's the author. It's self-published. He can, he can get away with that. Uh, and there is a second edition of that coming out in just a couple weeks. So for, you know, they, whatever reason, decided to pull it, but it is, it is coming back on the market later on in July. Yeah, that's really amazing. And to add to what you were saying about the Sachem Fund, the funny thing is that it was headquartered on the same block that I live in, in Connecticut right now. Um, and out of that fund, he and his first wife used to go to all of these, like, social progressive cause type events and he actually met the partner that he ended up running this railroad with um for four decades at a league of women voters event and uh, that he claims in the memoir that in addition to kind of being disillusioned with him throwing money at all these causes and them i guess not being solved immediately um to put it bluntly i guess um he said that working in the railroad industry and dealing with like the bureaucracy and the government regulations and trying to make this railroad um, that could have gone bankrupt and easily would have if he didn't um, like lay off half the workforce, for example, or fly around the country looking for non-union employees when they went on strike in 1987, um, like personally with his private jet, um, picking up employees one by one to fly to wherever he needed them. If he didn't take all of these extreme measures, um, those companies would have gone bankrupt. So he got really frustrated with big government. And he says that that was a major force in shifting his politics um, to something that was more in line with like his family's Republican roots, um, which was super interesting. Also transitioning yeah, I, to something. I, yeah, I, go I, ahead. Uh, when I, uh, those were fascinating details mm -hmm. when I was reading your part of the copy, you know, when I was going through that and I'm like, wait, they met at a yeah. women voters meeting? Yeah, <laughs> it's wild. He was flying in scabs on a private jet. Like those are, that, that was fascinating stuff that you were able to dig up there. Yeah. and. Part of your copy that I was reading when we were going through the draft that really fascinated me with, 
was with all of his work with Amelia Earhart and trying to find like the wreckage of her plane. Can you say more about that? It yeah, seems so yeah, one off. And, the... Yeah. Yeah, it, it does. Um, and it, 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 it sort of makes sense in that, um, you know, one of the, our art team did an amazing job with this, uh, with the photos for this, for the article. And one of the things that really struck me was they had a picture of Andrew Mellon with Amelia Earhart, uh, which was just fascinating seeing that. So Mel Timothy Mellon got involved in it. Um, you know, he, the appeal was that Earhart at some point had been involved with a company that was uh, one of the predecessors to the train company that he ended up owning. Uh, they had briefly dabbled in airways. So he was interested in that part. He was also a pilot. I think he says, what was by 2015, he had over 10,000 hours of flying. Um, so he funded an expedition to uh, the South Pacific to go look for the wreckage. And he gave him over a million dollars. And he later on sued saying that he, uh, this group found the wreckage before it accepted his donation. Uh, the suit ended up getting tossed. The judge had to weigh in saying, you know, that is not definitively that they found the wreckage. That's your opinion. And the group got to, you know, the, the case was just tossed. Uh, Mellon appealed it and that was, that was tossed as well. But it was a really interesting uh, charitable donation there because I think it is a, uh, it was a nonprofit. Yeah, that's really amazing. But yeah, he just seems like such a fascinating guy and we wish we could have heard from him more, but it was really interesting to get to read his memoir and read all these books about him and learn about how he got to this place where he is today, where we don't think he has any heirs. So it seems like he's just throwing a very large portion of his wealth that he's inherited and earned over the years um, to this cause that he thinks is going to save the United States, which I guess at this moment is President or former President Trump. So yeah, super fascinating. Thank you so much for joining me and talking about this. It was wonderful working on this article with you, Zach. Likewise, good chatting with you, Phoebe. Thanks.